Uh, my name is Michael Case. I work with Kiara Consulting. We do um, a variety of different things, but basically solving engineering problems for companies. We work um, with things as small as um, you know little processors with no operating system and 4K and really not much more than that, um, up to large cloud distributed systems that handle 30,000 uh, requests a minute and about 10 terabytes of data a day. And so everything in between is where we are. We're in uh, medical equipment and scientific equipment, consumer products. Um, some of it's what we call honest work. Honest work is what you can describe to your mom and she knows, uh, by the way, it's my mom to be very specific. It's something you could describe to my mom and she would understand what the work was. Um, and then we do other things probably like most of us do every day too. So um, this, this session's labeled Modern C++ in an Embedded uh, World. Really what I wanted to label it was Contemporary C++ on Bare Metal Embedded, but I was pretty certain John would not accept that. So um, we're back with the, uh, the modern C++. Uh, unlike a lot of sessions that you may have been where, where I'm speaking, there will be very little code in this. There's, there's code at the end. Um, but the purpose of it is not to explain a library or a technique that we're using, but a whole variety of ways that we get to the point where we could put embedded, um, excuse me, where we can put C++ on small processors, or in this case, just bare metal. Bare metal meaning there's not an operating system running. There are a lot of reasons that you might choose not to have an operating system uh, running on your device, and in this case, uh, this is what this project's about. So let's talk about the project. Um, anybody have a clue what this thing is? Excellent, wow, okay. <laughs> so you will notice uh, there are these, these valves or hoses. Um, this is a shaker and the, the purpose of the shaker is to grab a tree like an almond tree or something like that and just you know rattle it without hurting it and have the, the nuts fall onto the ground that it then sweeps in and pulls up and goes to the next one. Now you would think that these things might run on some diesel engine that's running around and that's the true part, but it's running with a diesel engine that's just pumping hydraulic fluid. All these hoses are all about because everything from the drive system to steering and things that spin and the shaker themselves, the whole entire unit runs off hydraulics. And this is very common in a lot of industries. So you have a big diesel engine to do nothing more than to pump hydraulic fluid through a manifold and, um, and to power other things in the system. Now, uh, I don't know the last time it is that you drove through the Central Valley in California, but if you do, it's fairly polluted. And the reason is, is because of things like this, for example. Um, so California has grants in which they give companies money to figure out how to reduce that pollution. Uh, we're doing work for one such company, and um, their system hooks directly up to hydraulics. So typically this is not what you would have. You would not have these cute little things at the bottom um, hooked directly up to like a hydraulic motor or a cylinder, you would actually have um, a hydraulic pump going through a manifold with valves that go on and off. One goes one way, one goes the other way, so you got these pair of valves so that you can make things happen. So it ends up becoming a fairly complicated system. Uh, the idea is, can you do this instead powering it through electricity, like a hybrid system? So you have a very small gas-powered engine that powers um, like your hybrid car. And so instead, all the hydraulics are basically um, off of uh, some type of a, uh, an electric motor. So that's the idea. Um, in order to get to this somewhere, there is an embedded something or another, right? Because everything seems to have an embedded something or another. The embedded something or another here is an MPU. Um, you probably heard the term MCU. The real big difference is, is that MPUs have some type of resource off board that they need in order to do their job. In this case, this MPU has memory, RAM, excuse me, ROM, off-board. It has no flash that's internal in it. Um, it has like everything else in the world, including the kitchen sink, but it doesn't actually have a flash. So that's off um, to the top. And you'll see that in this picture, we've got um, two actually different types of memory banks and an NFC, which is actually a memory bank too. <clears throat> and they communicate through different interfaces, um, depending upon what the unit is. There's a pressure sensor here. Um, there are two different ADCs, analog to digital converters, one that communicates through something called SPI, we'll talk about more a little bit later, another one through I2C, um, and there's an FPGA, which we're also doing the, the programming for, 
and we communicate to that through a SPI. Uh, the MPU is speaking to this encoder, so if you have a motor spinning, you probably like to know where it is for a variety of different reasons. Um, and then we have some more interesting things down here. There's USB because everybody wants to update things across USB in the field. There's CAN. CAN is the bus that's inside your car that requires everything to be able to communicate to each other. So there's a CAN system. EtherCAT is more known inside of the industrial systems. Uh, it's like CAN running across an Ethernet. You can think of it that way. So there are some number of things that this MPU needs to speak to, handle, and service in a timely manner. Um, this is actually about half of the I.O. that it has to deal with as far as peripherals that are connected. There are a few other things. This is a science experiment. <laughs> this is what our current lab bench or for this thing looks like. Um, and this is a common way to bring something up initially. You buy however many dev boards somebody will sell you. They sell you these dev boards because they're trying to, um, like for example, this one is an analog to digital converter. This one's another analog to digital converter. Uh, one's a SPI, one's an I2C. They want you to buy the chip, so they sell you this dev board for very little money. And then you hobble all these things together. Now you'll notice this is all hobbled together on top of like this nice machined aluminum thing. That's the number one indicator that it was not a double E that put this together. It was the mechanical engineer who said, hey, I got this piece of aluminum. <laughs> so uh, that's bad. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, hands already. Yes, sir. Well, if I can point out some typos. It looks like that connection port over there is not even hooked up to the machine. Uh, which one? The one on the far right, upper right hand Oh, corner. yes. This, you know what? This one is not hooked up to anything. Yeah. You know why? Because sometimes you get a dev board and it's configured to behave a certain way. And this one was configured, we need to talk to it through I2C. It's configured to speak this other thing. We can make it speak I2C, but it requires the movement of 36 um, very small zero ohm um, <laughs> resistors on the board. And so uh, weighing all of that, we decided that the board is supposed, the real board is supposed to be here next week, literally next week, right? But they've been saying that literally next week for, I think we're on mm, 40 days now or something like that. So <laughs> it's been a while. Um, as well as the rest of the bits. Now, when this is all put together, um, the board, the fabs we already have back, they're, you know, they're, they're fairly small. So all of this will shrink down to some very small thing that goes inside of a case. Um, all right. So, What's inside? This is just a, a quick look of kind of what's, what is this MPU thing that we're talking about. And um, I don't want to get into the gory details because of it's a small chart. And, and really what I want to point out is this up here is the processor that we're mostly looking at. It is a, a Cortex R4 um, with an FPU. So it's, we call it an R4F. Um, it has a variety of different functionality. And now notice down here, there's this thing they magically call the RN engine. And it is an M3, a Cortex M3. This actually has two processors inside of it on the die, um, as well as a variety of different things, all kinds of things like two CAN buses, uh, wow, an Ethernet Mac built into it, tons of GPIO, just lots of cred, OK? <laughs> um, and then another interesting thing is there's this piece of memory over here and another one over here. This diagram is like, this is the brochure you look at to see, hey, do I want to use this thing because it's got all the right stuff on it? And you just kind of like quickly look at these block diagrams, right? But this tells you nothing about how they're connected. Um, so one thing that's interesting is if you're going to try to figure out how to get code to boot and load on something without an operating system, you need to suddenly know a little bit about the internals of it. And when we go to look at this, what we find is that there is the Cortex right here, and it has this thing called a VIC, whereas the M3 has the NVIC. Uh, this is one of the differences between the R4 series is a real-time processor, uh, which means that it has a vector interrupt controller as opposed to a nested vector interrupt controller, which is the M3. Um, it also has this very cool thing called TCM. Um, so TCM is tightly coupled memory. As opposed to, you can see the bus that is up here. There's this normal system bus you would expect in memory somewhere um, right here. So there's some memory. And so the M3 can go through these buses, and it can eventually get here. It's not apparent, but the R4 can also go to the buses and get to the, the memory it needs to get to. But the tightly coupled memory is connected directly to the core, and we can get to it very, very quickly. 
Um, so that's great, it also has cache and things of that sort. The thing to think about at this point is this system is sold as an R4. So Renesis sells this chip, it's an R4F, and it has this magical M3 in it, along with the disclaimer of, don't touch that chip. We're going to do something with it. We're going to use it for our own purposes. That, by the way, is usually a keyword for, this is going to be a very hard project to get my tools to work on. And we're gonna see some of that. Um, okay, so, this, um, this system actually has a bit of hard real-time associated with it also. Um, you can imagine that as a motor is spinning, um, we're taking encoder measurements along the way. There's a place where we have to take an encoder measurement. We have to do some calculation. We have to make an adjustment to the output and uh, do that loop again, right? And depending upon a lot of things within the control system, the frequency of how often we have to do that, or um, how often, excuse me, let's try that again. How often we have to do that for per rotation is dependent upon a variety of different things um, of what we're trying to solve in the control system. And then, of course, the, the motor doesn't spin at you know, one hertz. So um, it, it spins at a variety of different speeds. Uh, so let's say towards, towards the upper end for hydraulics, it's 4,000 hertz. So 4,000 hertz, we need to do so many samples per rotation in order to get this done. If we miss our window, that's bad. Like people aren't dying bad, but we, can't, we, we have to hit the window so we can make sure that the motor moves to the next spot and does the proper thing for, with the right feedback. So we have this bit of hard real time that also has to occur. Okay, so the question is why use C++ for this project? Why not just use C like everybody else in their right mind uses C? Uh, first, I submitted a talk about this. So I have to <laughs> use C++ because don't really have another choice. Um, no, actually, we. I typically try to use C++ if I can um, for a variety of different reasons. One, um, it provides abstractions that I believe are easier to work with and have a, I will have a better result in the end. I'm able to think about problems at a higher level. Now what's interesting is what I think is a, a good thing, the, the majority of the embedded world thinks is a horrible thing. They hate abstractions. We will see a lot of that today. I also think that there will be fewer bugs and I'll finish sooner if I can actually spend a couple weeks or whatever it takes to get the C++ compiler running. And the reason for that is if you spend any time at all looking at embedded code, you'll find after no matter how many people or how many companies you look at, there are a variety of different errors that occur and they're like the same ones, the same types of mistakes that cause people problems over and over again. And those problems are already solved with idioms that exist in C++. So I don't want to have those problems because to be honest, I would make them also likely and uh, that would be very embarrassing. So uh, I don't want to be embarrassed. So we're going to start with uh, getting some vendor supplied tools. Uh, we want to get usually just the vendor tools as is so we can get the board just up and running, have something that we say, hey, this works. It does something that I understand and now I can muck with it as opposed to just starting from complete scratch. Um, so some of the challenges um, or reasons that we'd want to do this, you'll see that there's this thing right in the middle, this code generator for pin routing. This is a, this is a common thing with, with embedded chips these days. There's some type of a fabric in there which is going to route how things move around. And um, sometimes it's a proprietary format in order to load that in. Uh, and you have to use their tools, you don't have a choice. And they're just built into these IDEs that you get, which we'll talk a little more about here soon. Uh, there's also code generator for, in this, our case, this RN engine, that's the M3 processor. Um, and then this working startup code, linker scripts and demo code, working is very subjective. You would never want to ship with what comes. You're going to, you're going to spend a lot of time vetting that and making sure it does what you expect, but it, it's gonna boot and do something. You're gonna make, you know, Lines wiggle and things of that sort. What is RN engine stand for? I have no idea. Renesis, Renesis something or another. Renesis is the chip manufacturer. Okay. Um, and the idea of the RN engine, I guess I should mention this is, so we have these two processors. Uh, the, the R4 is for us to do whatever we want. 
And the M3 is basically a coprocessor to handle communication. It's going to handle things like CAN bus communications. It's going to handle the encoder communication. It's going to handle EtherCAT. The idea is we don't want the real-time processor having to deal with slow, boring I.O. activities. We want somehow to have all the protocols handled somewhere else and then just get digested packets up. All right. <clears throat> The story you're about to be told is a specific example of one group's adventure. However, it represents the engineers across the embedded world. That works better with a mic, by the way. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's a going, we're going to start our Twilight Zone vendor saga here. Um, and you know, I just want, personally, the vendor tool C++ compiler, click the link, download it for Linux. That's personally what I want. Um, I just want you to see what it says when I do this. This domain expired 8-23-2017's pending renewal or deletion. Are you kidding me? This is, this is not a fly-by-night chip manufacturer, by the way. They make chips that go into cars, lots of them, probably your car. And I can't download the tools. <laughs> By the way, of course, just like you, when you see this message, you're probably like, oh, I'm going to get that domain right now. <laughs> Which, by the way, I wasn't able to, but I tried. <laughs> so um, it ends up that I'm not the only person on this project. And so I did like anybody in my, my position should do at this point, which is delegate. Um, and so Sharon has uh, 30 years of software experience and 15 in embedded. Sharon also likes. Uh, to use Windows. You can, in, in our company, you can use whatever platform you want for your machine. And she it was the first in a very long time to pick a Windows machine when she started for us last year. I'm like, awesome, because I bet the Windows tools work. So Sharon got tasked with the first deliverable that we needed to show, as well as, hey, can you also see if you can get C++ working on this device, OK? Um, so yeah. <laughs> I did feel sorry for Sharon. I do, uh, we have Donut Day. I do bring her a fritter, especially, because I do feel sorry about that choice. So this is what you get. Um, they call it E2 Studio. Um, it's built on top of Eclipse, like a lot of tools are. Um, the thing to see is here at the top, it says Code Generator Tool Tree. I don't want a Code Generator Tool. That's, at the end of the day, this is going to cause me problems. IDEs are how people like to sell things. They love to do this. How am I going to integrate this inside of my CI? How, how am I going to work with Sharon at the same time? This becomes a complete disaster. These IDs are, are horrible. <laughs> um, so we, we start this thing up. Yes? Talk. Yeah, but you, you're talking about abstraction. The IDE is concrete. Uh, <laughs> OK. So the comment is that the IDE is concrete and I like abstractions. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the concrete boots while I go swimming. So it ends up that version 14, um, it, it had some flaky behavior as tools often do, right? I mean, like not more than normal flaky behavior for tools. It was just flaky. Um, and so Sharon started asking support a few questions. The first thing they said is use version 16. Well, we actually had tried to use version 16, but the license file didn't work, so we had to go back to 14 because it worked on that one. And they got that worked out. And 16, you know, okay, so 16. And the second comment, of course, not surprising, was, goodness, don't use C++. Like, what's wrong with these people? Um, so, yeah, that was the comment from support. Don't use C++. Oh, yeah, get 16. Um, oh, and... Um, Sharon ended up being quite clever and found a way to get C++ to work. Uh, it, it required, you know, one of those things where it was clearly by accident, right? You load the file, you do this, you change this project, you back out, you go back, you open this other thing up, and look, now it's in C++ mode. Awesome. It was in C++ mode, it linked, it loaded onto the device, and it kind of ran. It was clear that the linker script wasn't quite right. There were some problems, right, with the normal ones, like static initialization of constructors and things like that. It, so there are certain things that didn't work, but it wasn't a disaster. It was just a little flaky. So I was like, goodness, don't use C++. OK, well, whatever. So OK, version 16, awesome. It fixed flaky, flaky behavior. So that's good, right? That's the good, the good. The bad is 
probably the real reason that support wanted us to move is because we can no longer figure out our one cool trick in order to make um, our C++ work anymore. So they basically figured out how to stop that from occurring inside the IDE. Um, so uh, that ended that experiment. And at this point, I was actually hoping that Sharon by this point would have written my slides. Um, <laughs> Tal's probably taking notes and telling Sharon, don't tell Sharon this later, okay? So, um, it, it um, yeah, at this point it was apparent that Sharon needed to continue working in C and making the product do something. And this C++ thing was going to just be a lot more complicated than we wanted for, for the moment and set it aside. Um, this is the ugly part though. And this is just a common truth, which is most of the embedded world hates C++. They hate C++ for a variety of different reasons. Um, but the attitude that comes across, and you see it in tool vendors all the time, is we know best. We know what's best for you. And as a result, I'm going to disable any ability for you to use C++ inside of this IDE. Partially, they don't want to support it. And I, and I understand that. But, um, it's almost like they go through hoops in order to make it so incredibly complicated and difficult that you, you just give up and don't do it. Um, it's not just that, though. Almost always, right before I give a talk, I go to, to the internet, and the internet never disappoints. <laughs> and um, Stephanie had put up this, this question, I believe just last week, about whether people will use modern C++ when it's not just uh, readability and usability, but they have performance concerns. And in general, I think as a community, we clearly have some work to do because these are the responses, or just a couple of the responses that have come back. Uh, and these people are not necessarily in, involved in the embedded world. Uh, you can, we all know what Arvid already thinks because of being on Slack, right? That one, that one was easy. I just saw his picture and I cut and paste whatever that was. Um, so, you know, there are a variety of different opinions about C++ and none of them are flattering. So why is this? Why isn't just the C++, sorry, why is it not just the embedded world, but in general, a lot of people have this view. Well, a lot of people have this view is because they think of C with classes. They think of what occurred in the 90s. I was introduced to C++ and started writing C++ in 1990 and grew up with the Bush and Rumbaugh showing up at our office during lunch, Schleyer and Miller giving lectures, trying to convince us that there were certain object-oriented ways to solve problems. And the reality is, is they don't work really well, right? But if you came up in that world and that is your mentality of what you think C++ was, you left it a long time ago and you haven't really rethought any of it at all. C++ is not obviously an object-oriented language. It can support object-oriented constructs. It can support a lot of different ways for us to write software. And we've got to pick the right way at the right time. So I think that's part of it. Um, the other, as I've kind of alluded to this a little bit, is this idea of abstractions. In the embedded world, people don't like abstractions. They like to think that they write C code and what they write is exactly what's in the assembler. And they believe that firmly. And I'll tell you why they believe that firmly, is they compile with dash O zero. <laughs> a lot. Because they want to see that. It is very disturbing when you hook your JTAG up and you start like going through code and it skips like, where's my code? What happened to it, right? People don't like that. All right, so let's back to this. Like, are, are all IDs all absolutely horrible? Well, they're not absolutely all horrible. Uh, so, you know, they serve a purpose, which I call time to hello world. Time to hello world has driven a lot of industry, embedded industry in particular, for probably the last 10 or 15 years. Dev boards, all these different things that we get, tools, in order to make it so that you can evaluate something very quickly and pick that product. Pardon me? Sales. Sales. But you know what? It's not just the embedded world. How many of you have written 
a header-only library. Yeah, exactly. It's also in C++ because for some reason, time to hello world is really important. We're going to get punished later for it. You get punished because of a header-only library. If you don't want to learn how to use your linker, right? Because you don't know your tool set in general, you're going to incur punishment every time you compile, as opposed to taking a little bit of time and developing a library that can be used for both. I totally understand it. I also have header-only libraries, right? <laughs> but time to hello world drives a lot of things. Um, OK, so there are some good things. It's easy to get development boards up and running. Uh, it usually has a built-in way to upload whatever you just wrote to the dev board. That's great, because you don't have to you know, kind of mess around with that. Debugging without hassle, usually just like built in there. Like how, what magic is that, that somehow on the chip it's all working right? You know, it's just like, it just works. Uh, the problems, it's centered around a single developer workflow usually, hard to integrate with a team, uh, typically really hard to integrate with CI systems. It hides, in my opinion, too much of the build magic. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's code generated. I don't know how to do that myself in such a way that I can integrate that into my CI. All right, so uh, making it all work. So in YouTube, there's often in the comments somewhere like at time, and I would tell you, but my clock is not working. Um, at time such and such, that's where you want to go start watching. So hopefully, this is maybe where you want to start watching. I don't know. <laughs> so how do we make it all work together? Uh, first, I want to just use standard tools. Um, I want to use GCC, just like plain old GCC. I want to use CMake, not really, but I'm going to try to use CMake because it's going to be cool, I hope. And um, I want to just use like static analysis and analyzers, continuous integration, and continuous deployment. Um, so in this sense, continuous deployment me means something to different people. To me, it means that the CI produces build results and artifacts that can be used by the continuous development. That can be pushed into a test frame, into a test section. Those can be um, promoted into different types of testing phases and release phases, things of that sort. So, um, I, and I want this so that I can actually have traceability back from what shipped to actually where did all the code come from. Um, so I, I think I'm going to bag on it because I have to live in the embedded world a lot. This idea of rigor, which you probably live with most all the time, doesn't exist, generally speaking, in that world which is why they also aren't interested necessarily in something other than just the IDE, right? There's not necessarily that need. So this was easy. First step, I just went to arm.com and downloaded it, literally by pressing the download button. I mean, how hard could that be? I also, granted, lucked out because the Cortex um, 4, R, R, excuse me, R4 was just started to get supported back in like October or something like that. So, you know, I was a little lucky. And then I just like, hey, let's just write a CMake file. That seems like easy enough, right? Now, and then of course you pause and you go, well, this is just not going to work. There's no way that this CMake file possibly could work for my target over there because this is going to build something for my machine. But that's okay because I know already how to deal with that. We have to deal with this all the time. I just need to give it a toolchain file, right? So I need to tell what toolchain I want to use in order to do this build. So let's set one up. Uh, our CMake system name is going to be generic. That basically tells it that it's bare, bare metal. We don't have an operating system. Um, and we're going to use an ARM. I give it a path to where the compiler will be. I've set up a path and, and what the cross compiler will be. And then um, assign for each of these variables the C, the C, the linker. Um, and then this the thing we want to look at just for a moment, uh, the object copy. So anybody familiar with object copy? There's a few. Okay, so all object copy is going to do basically is take the output of the linker and allow us to change the format into another format. So out of this is going to become elf. I'm going to get elf format. I don't really want an elf file. I don't know how to put that on my flash, right, to be useful. So I need to convert that actually just into a raw binary representation of what that memory is that the, the elf describes. Object copy is going to allow me to do that. Um, and then I'm going to say, hey, also, when you're trying to compile and check if these compilers are valid or not, use a static library as opposed to trying to build an EXE. Because a static library doesn't care about startup code and all kinds of symbols and stuff. It just wants to compile something. This is how you tell CMake 
Use a static library instead. If you don't do this, it's going to complain bitterly because it can't link. When it tries to say, hey, is that a valid compiler? It won't, it won't pass. So this is kind of like the magic. This is the new magic on how you're supposed to do it with, with CMake. All right, that's what it looks like for the first part. We're going to add some more things, which is like, hey, you can find your executables on the host, but please do not find the libraries from the host paths. That would be very disappointing. And then um, some other information like uh, what kind of MPU do we have? Um, what kind of floating point processors inside of this? There's actually a, um, a B3 processor, uh, D16, which means that it, is, it has 16 double wide registers for floating point inside of it. Um, so we give it all of the details so that it will generate code that is efficient for us. And then we actually cache that. So we tell CMake, stick this in the cache so that everything else that tries to use values can find it. Because I'm not going to look inside of the variables. All right, so there you go. That was the CMake magic. I'm not a CMake expert. That's what I did to make it work. That's the stuff. I also learned this conference that I can stick it all in one slide. I just say, see, if you make it smaller, it sits on one slide. How long did it take you to figure out all these uh, compiler options? Oh, the compiler options are easy because, um, so figuring out the compiler options is not difficult in the sense that these options, uh, I, I just need to look up and see what kind of core am I dealing with. So uh, these are just, just mapped to the core that I have and the options that that core has related to it. So it, it's not difficult to find the options. What might be difficult is if you're trying to compile something that works for lots of different things. I don't care about that, though. I've usually done the trick of, if you have the ID, have it run, look at the SKU. Oh, yeah. From there, kind of go if they're using something. Yeah, R Richard's suggesting you can look at the IDE output and see what, it, what it's using for SPU. That, um, that works to a level like the get things up and running level, uh, it probably it may or may not work for optimizing making sure you have the right thing. And in fact, it, it wouldn't have worked for this because the IDE actually wanted a soft floating point unit. A lot of, also a lot of vendors like Site or their forums and even ARM sites, like their forums have a lot of people like in the hacker community working on it. Yeah, th there's plenty of forums that might give this information. Yeah. Having been on the, the NSF SQL instead of things on SIPMIC, instead of things, we usually don't get this information from the, we have to discard all these things and figure out what to do before we actually publish the ID. You said you're finding it out from Google. So it looks like somebody's in the front row that I'm criticizing maybe their ID and didn't realize it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we don't use it internally, by the way. <laughs> and they don't use it internally. <laughs> oh, did I? <laughs> Scratch that part. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Former employer. <laughs> so now we're just going to go ahead and run that and type make. All right. And, um, and then I get this as an output. Hey, you're missing this symbol called exit. All right. I, I make, I'm making some progress, right? But uh, the exit symbol, uh, underscore exit, something needs to define that. It doesn't just happen. And when you start doing embedded, especially on bare metal, you start realizing how amazingly wonderful your tool vendors are and all the startup code they supply to you and the linker scripts that are like just tuned just right for your operating system. And you're like, those are the best people in the whole world. <laughs> like you guys are excited about, about whatever the next 17 feature is. I'm just excited that I can just type in make and not have to do what we're about ready to do. <laughs> All right, so you get to this point and you realize, okay, well, that, that's fine. Now I've got to do some work. The work is, is you've got, to, you've got to actually crack open the manual and figure out what happens with this device when you hit the reset line. Every device is different. They all behave differently. They do different things. When I can say crack open the manual, this portion of the manual for this device is 2,600 pages. It's actually just over 2,600 pages. It, it, it just like any good ISO standard, it says, please see document such and such for how the ARM instruction set, set, set works, right? It doesn't even talk about ARM. It doesn't talk about any of that stuff. It just talks about like registers and things like that. So you go and you find the section that talks about what happens with reset. You learn about memory layouts. What are the needs for startup? What kind of peripherals 
Um, what are they going to need? Do they need power up at a certain time? What ordering does that occur? Um, and of course, we're going to actually need to enable a couple more languages, right? In order to do all this. So this is what the memory map looks like, the, the basic version of the memory map out of the manual. Uh, you can see on the far left-hand side is the Cortex-M3, the thing that we're not supposed to touch, but we're going to have to know how to get the code loaded into it at some point for this to work, so we got to know a little bit about it. Uh, the R4 is right next to that. Uh, the, the um, let's see if I can get this to work here. Um, maybe not. Okay. You can see that our R4 starting at address zero is this um, tightly coupled memory. There's an A and there's a B. The A is 512K, the B is 32K. It works out the, the 512K tightly coupled memories, we're gonna stick our program. Zero is not null, people. It's a real address, it's important. <laughs> um, and B, tightly coupled memory, is actually we're gonna put our stack. We're gonna throw our stack into the B section. So once we start understanding where things are, we're going to go inside and we're going to create a linker script. And the linker script is going to start saying, this is where the memory laid out is. This is where addresses exist. These are real addresses. As far as that processor is concerned, when it accesses address zero, this, this one in particular, the chip selects work in such a way that it's accessing tightly coupled memory A. So we set this up. And then, um, you know, the left, rest is left to the student. We won't bore you to death. But this is kind of what a linker script looks like. And part of the reason for throwing this up here, knowing that this is probably a, a diverse crowd, is some of this is going to actually look really familiar to you. you. You may not know what the startup, what start looks like, but, you know, there's an interrupt vector that's going to end up here at the beginning for us. There are some other things in here, like your text. You've heard of text, right? Shake your head. Yes. We've heard of text. Read-only data, there's going to be a read-only data section. Oh, the TORS, yeah. this linker script set up for uh, C++. We're going to have our constructors and our destructors listed here. These are static things. Uh, we've got some more RAM. Um, we've got, where is it? Oh, there it is, the BSS section towards the end. There's, this goes on for many, many pages, all right? And the linker knows where into memory to put something because of a linker script. Now, in this case, we're not relocating anything. We have to stick it exactly where it belongs so that it works. That's what the chip expects. Nothing gets relocated. Now, we come back and we say, OK, well, let's update our CMake file a little bit more and add some more stuff. Um, now, that tool file that I had, uh, you, some of this stuff would go in here. For example, starting from the top, um, project, you now can see that we've actually, we're not we back up just 30 seconds. Pretend like I just started talking. Can we do that? <laughs> so here at the top, the project file, we're going to add a couple more languages. So we've got now C++, C, and assembly. Um, we're going to set up a linker script and a bunch of flags that we want to use. Notice we're going to compile with OS. That's size. Size is very important to us. Size is basically saying O2, except for the optimizations in which size would be impacted. So it's O2 optimizations, except for the ones where size would be impacted. We're also turning on um, linker time optimizations. So LTO has to be turned on in two spots. You turn it on at the compile, because it puts additional uh, information inside of the ELF file. And then you turn it on at the linker, and the linker uses that information, part of the AST information, to um, make things even smaller for us. So we're going to get optimization in both of those. We're going to tell it no start files. We don't want start files. And we don't want exceptions, for lots of reasons. So, uh, we, we get done with all of this, we add our linker script, which uh, is it somewhere on here, there we are. Oh, that was sad. So the linker script right here, we, we just add that in as part of our link flags. And now we're gonna go ahead and add in um, the other things we need, like we're gonna write some assembly for startup, we're going to have some assembly of our, our vector table, we're going to have some assembly about the loader init, and then we're like, I'm done writing assembly, and then I'm going to write the rest of the loader in C, which will eventually call main. Okay, so this is all the stuff that runs before main. Gets the chip working the way it's supposed to, sets up interrupts properly, um, things of that sort. And then we're going to add a custom command. This is that custom command using this object copy that I was mentioning before, where we're going to take whatever was just built, this is that elf format, and we're going to actually um, output that in a binary format. <clears throat> we run it again, 
And, um, ooh, bummer, fail. Now, remember I went through great extents putting in this flag to tell it to not actually try to compile an exe to make sure that the compiler worked. And it, it seemed like it was working when I just had the C++ compiler. So I said, hmm, let's just try it with just the C compiler. It works with just the C compiler. In fact, it works if you have one compiler listed, but if you have two compilers listed, whatever the second one is seems to ignore the flag. And at this point, I was about ready to give up on CMake because it was just for bonus points, and I felt like I was really losing. <laughs> um, so yeah, in fact, I even I downloaded, built the latest dev version. Maybe that would do it. Finally, I'm like, okay, well, just one more try. Let's look inside the magic file. The magic file, and look at that. There's a way to actually say, uh, hey, the C compiler works, don't even try to test it, okay? Now that's not inside of the documentation. They've rewritten their documentation at Kitware a couple times now on, on how um, cross-compiling works. So um, as far as I can tell, both of the things that they tell you for advice, you know, ni neither of the things that they tell you for advice work, but, um, but this works. <laughs> so now we just add this to our command line. We compile, woo, things are great. And uh, you'll notice what came out is of this file, if I say file, the output, this is that elf thing, right? And we took that and we ran object copy on it, we made this thing called kernel bin, and it's just a data file. This is just a mapping that I can actually flash onto the device. So where's this gonna go? Well, um, the other little thing that we haven't talked about is, uh, you know, nothing actually just boots. That would be nice, but that's just not how things work especially if it has a tightly coupled memory. What it does is it goes and it says, where's a bootloader that I can load into what you're going to use later for some other memory, stack, and then I'm gonna run that out of stack so that you can actually load from whatever you need to and set up the program and make it all pretty and then start it. So um, the reality is we have to still write a bootloader. So we're gonna write a bootloader, but we're not gonna do that today. So let's move on. Any idea how much time I have? Yeah, I don't either. 45. 45. I'm at 45 or I have 45 left? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I know. You're at 46. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so now this is the other place where there might be a YouTube comment that says the good stuff starts at time mark 45. So let's talk a little bit more about why C++. So, Zero cost abstractions are things that we're used to on a common basis. If you're here at this conference, you're used to this concept. Um, and, and I'll tell you now, I'm, I'm half pandering to the YouTube audience at the moment because not everybody knows what that is. So we're gonna actually talk a little bit about zero cost abstractions. Uh, another reason that I like to use C++ is because the abstractions are going to help me debug my business logic on a nice computer, sitting somewhere in a nice location that doesn't have a JTAG cable hooked up to it, okay? Uh, and um, I wanna be able to do things like enforce correctness through types. And again, I want, this, I want an abstraction. So if you were at Ben's talk earlier today, this is a lot what Ben was talking about also. We wanna take the what's and move them up. And we wanna take the how's and push them down. The things at the top are the value that you add every day. You may not think about your job that way. You might think about your job currently as implementing the very best state machine in the whole world. But actually it's what the state machine does that gives the company value. It gives the product value. And we want to actually spend a lot of time thinking about those things and moving it up. And the things that are hardware specific, the things like drudgery, we want to move down into, into libraries, okay? We want, to, we want to push that down. Now, this might seem obvious to you, but this is really uncommon in an embedded project. Everything is twisted together. The value added proposition, the what it does, is tied up with the how to do it. Always. They're just tangled together. There is no separating them. Which is why the idea of just running this on your own machine in a mode which doesn't require a real simulator 
is foreign. Because if you start doing this, right, if you push the value up and the hardware spec down, you now have this nice dividing line where you can think about what is it that this thing solves and how can I actually make sure it's going to do that with tests. <laughs> tests. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you haven't seen it, watch Ben Dean's. Dean, 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 Dean. Oh. <laughs> That's almost embarrassing. <laughs> well, anyhow. Everybody call him Dean. From now on, Dean. Uh, yeah. Um, and his talk was easy to use, hard to misuse, declarative style in C++. All right. So uh, <laughs> we'll get that later. So, <laughs> what is a zero? <laughs> What's a zero cost abstraction? So uh, let's just talk quickly about this. It, if I have a program, main, um, and I can type some numbers in it, and I want to go ahead and count the number of eights that are in there, I can call this method called count value, and I pass it um, the pointer at the beginning and the pointer at the end, and, and I want eights, all right? And how do we might implement that you know, there are a lot of different ways this would look very familiar to somebody, both in C and in C++. You can kind of figure out what this thing's going to do, right? We can just iterate through and try to figure out if the thing that's there is an 8, and if it's an 8, then I increment my sum, and at the end I just return it. Make sense? All right. So, um, this is the output for that, and it might be a little surprising, uh, just that it's so much. When we start looking a little more carefully, what we see is uh, up here we've got our method count value, and it's still inside of our assembly. Um, and we have here, here inside of, this is our main. Here's our call. Oh, we see the call to string uh, to long. It, it's over here because it got inlined, right? So we have an inlined version. We're not calling count value, and we've got count value. So one thing that we can look at right away is we can say, oh, well, um, if I stick this inside of an anonymous namespace, then the system would know that it's not being used by any other translation unit, right? And I would expect then that would uh, do something for me at least. A and it does. This is what I get out, okay? So um, this is the setup. Now, the question is, and, and probably everybody in here, I hope, does this code bother you? Yeah. <laughs> this, code, this code bothers us. It, it feels uncomfortable. It makes us, or it should, makes us, make us feel a little uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. Um, and we can just start with the raw loop, right? Mm -hmm. And we can look at it and go, well, you know, we have actually a perfectly good algorithm that's supposed to do this for me. Count if. Could I just use count if? Maybe I could just use count if. That might be nice. So count if takes iterators and a predicate. So I'm going to just pass in the predicate by the lambda. Now, if you are used to algorithms, this is easy to read. If you're not used to algorithms, this is incredibly foreign. But everything that we start with is foreign at some point, right? And this becomes easy to identify and read at some point because we just read it, count if. Count if. So what does this do, though? Well, it's almost identical. The raw loop and the algorithm are almost identical. Now, I don't think, I don't think people in this room are probably surprised by that. You probably expected that to occur. If you've watched any of Jason's talks, right, his weeklies, you know that this is going to happen. But this is a foreign concept to most people in the embedded world. Because the for loop I understand, I'm going to step through that. In fact, that's how I'm going to discover that most of the world works. I'm going to use my debugger and step through things and watch. Wow. We want to lift ourselves up out of that, right? And get to this abstraction where we just say things like that and realize that there's actually no penalty, zero cost abstraction. We have an abstraction, it didn't cost me anything to use it. Marshall. I just what you said just suddenly resonated with me because I remember reading a book when I was in college 
We we will not actually mention the year, but uh, <laughs> the first two, two digits were one nine. <laughs> the third digit was either a seven or an eight. Um, and we discussed people how they write software. They wrote the software and they compiled it and then they convinced themselves it was correct by single stepping through it in the debugger. And once they convinced themselves that it was correct via that, yeah. they moved on to the next problem. Okay, so um, Marshall, um, without um, actually disclosing when he went to college, remembers reading a book that... Um, on paper. <laughs> on real paper, <laughs> that basically said you would write software, compile it, and then step through it to prove to yourself that it did what you expected it to do. Now, um, you're not a plant. This is awesome. Because most of the embedded world still works this way. They still step through everything to make sure that it does what they kind of expected to do. This is also now where I'm going to get a lot of comments in YouTube about how wrong I am. But... <laughs> well, it isn't like there's any other way to test it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom. <laughs> All right, so here's one question is, what if I, you know, what if I got totally fancy and I used captures? Because the capture would be a little more closely aligned to the other code that I had. Um, you know, what, what is the impact of doing something like that? Are things going to go wild? Well, no, sure. things look the same. Instructions. In fact, it's identical still. Well, that, oh, see? It's the same. It's so the zero, we, we would expect it to be the same. The, zero co the concept of zero cost abstractions is that we can think at a higher level and not pay the price. That's the other half of the problem. So while I can't also debug through these things, I also worry about how much code is this generating? What is it creating? Um, okay, so what if I did this with, um, with a data set? What's going to happen? Well, you know, now I've got the data set. And here it is. Um, it's going to be part of that BSS that gets loaded in. We saw a little earlier. Uh, you know, that, that might make me sad because, you know, I'm looking at this and going like, it should just know. All right, so what's the answer? Const. Yeah, okay, so we just like make this thing const. So now we've got const up here. And um, the compiler should know that this thing's not going to change on me. And sure enough, it doesn't. I now have a main that loads to and in what's going to be the return. Um, the question is, why did I not use std begin and std end? Uh, that would be one more thing to discuss and explain to somebody who's coming from a C world. So it was just to make the slide a little friendlier. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm really trying to concentrate on zero to cost abstraction at the moment. Okay. Doesn't cost anything to do this. And the compiler is going to do what you want. Now, let me tell you, at this point, if you were, I, I've talked about this with this particular slide at a chip manufacturer, and they kind of freaked out at this point. They were not happy. <laughs> because the compiler is doing a lot of stuff for you. That makes us excited. It makes a lot of people very nervous. All right. Um, so yeah. Then suddenly they don't know what else. Yeah, so this is the deal. Suddenly they can't reason about what it's going to do. But literally, people think they write C code. The assembly looks just like the C. Mm -hmm. There's nothing going to happen in between, right? We know that's not true also. And it's even more so not true in this case. Well, yes? I, I, I don't have sympathy for the chip manufacturers because they're reordering instructions on me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remember that. Yeah, so um, Richard has no sympathy for chip manufacturers who reorder his instructions. Um, OK, so polymorphism is another thing that, that people worry about. Uh, we're not going to. We're not going to go through this example, the CRTP, because we're going to run out of time if we do. But at the end of the day, we, we, want, we want polymorphism. How many of you know what CRTP is? Oh, no, I asked the wrong way. How many don't know what CRTP is? OK. So we're, for, for those who don't know, what we're going to try to do is we're going to create polymorphism. But most of the time, we don't want runtime polymorphism. We need the concept of polymorphism, and we already know at compile time what it is. And so we, CRTP gives us a technique to do that. Now, it ends up that um, 
if we go through that, that process, if we, if we write something with, with normal runtime polymorphism, we will automatically get all kinds of crud, uh, like virtual tables and runtime types, and um, we don't make a call. We actually have to load where the, um, the vector table is, then to figure out an offset, and then make a call. We've got a lot of additional overhead, right? If, if most embedded people would just die at this point. They just, this is, this is unacceptable. So we normally don't need runtime polymorphism. That, that's actually not what we need most of the time. We like polymorphism. So there's a way of doing it in static, CRTP. So I'll let you uh, look up the rest of that, of how that works. This is the, this is the key though, is um, if you don't, if you use CRTP to do your polymorphism, you end up with something a bit smaller, like quite a bit smaller. Now, I had to actually make that other slide trick it by turning devirtualization off. <laughs> so the compiler can be smart and can see through these things and devirtualize normal, what we think of normal runtime polymorphism, but it can't always do that. It's like a barrier that it, it has to now work at to see through. Um, so you can, get, you, can, you can get this with devirtualization, which is nice. Um, some takeaway though, just from this part at this point. When we have inline functions, when we have um, the compiler helping us out, the code that's generated doesn't look like the code that we wrote. And that's going to be potentially troublesome if we're debugging. Um, use const when you, when you can. Um, make all const things that are const, const. Uh, and stepping through things is going to be difficult when you're debugging. Let me give you an example, our count if that we had previously. So this is the count if. First of all, if I look at this, it's like, what is this, what is this garbage? You know, that part makes sense to me. I got that. But what is this garbage, right? So this is going to be just a little frightening as I'm stepping into this. First of all, just don't step into standard algorithms. But as we just heard from Marshall, this is how people do things. So let's say we didn't turn optimizations on. Let's turn no optimizations on. All right, here is what we're going to have for our output. And that page, and that page, and that page, and that page. Do you remember what this was before? Can you see why people like get frightened? Because they're like <coughs> compiling with O0. So don't do that. OS, OS. Um, all right. It, this is not a REPL system, it's not read, evaluate, print loop, right? Reason about your code, write your code in such a way that you can use high level abstractions without having to do this. Um, this is actually why, by the way, people use O0 as they look it up and they say, reduce compilation time and make debugging produce the expected results. <laughs> this is the default. All right. I. This is somewhat of a very personal opinion, but I think if you open your debugger, you already have problems. And I don't mean you already have problems like you have a bug. I mean you have something that you are unable to reason about, which is why you're opening your debugger. Or you've grown into the habit of using your debugger to figure out what your code does. Spend time understanding what it is that you wrote and look at the code. You should be able to noodle about it and reason about it and say, most likely this bug is in this location for most of the time. Granted, there are some hard time, hard bugs sometimes, but generally speaking, you should be able to really think about your code and know where the problem probably is. I open debuggers to look at other people's code. <laughs> <laughs> Richard opens up the debugger to understand other people's code. I think that's also a problem, Richard. <laughs> but there, there was a time where I spent a lot of time reverse engineering other people's binaries to work with them. Yeah. <laughs> so other people do that. Um, so I, I think one thing, and and this is kind of regardless of whether you're in the embedded world or not, is like we rely on the debugger a lot for something other than debugging. We rely on it as a way to try to figure out when the world's going on as opposed to actually understanding the code that we supposedly wrote or the code that we're supposedly maintaining. 
And if we actually understood that code, we probably wouldn't have to open up our debuggers so often. We could probably actually pinpoint the idea or the, the problem pretty quickly without doing that. Um, so here's the other part. Yes, this is going to be horrible on target. You're not going to get the debugged version on the target. It's not going to fit with the debug symbols. And that's OK, because we're going to go back to this thing, where we're trying to put the value proposition higher up. Our business logic is going to be high up. We can test to make sure that actually the algorithm does the proper thing on a machine. And know, with confidence at least, that on this particular machine, it worked. That doesn't mean it's, gonna, it's not going to work on the target. right? It might not work on the target. But at least you have confidence that the logic is correct. You can write tests and know that it's correct. Yeah. So the comment is, did I try the OG option since I'm using GCC? That's actually, dash OS dash OG is the way to go. Okay. And um, yeah, that's, there are, are plenty of articles about that combination. Works really well. I didn't you, realize they were combinable. Yeah, th those two are combinable. Um, okay, part of the reason I'm doing this is in the hardware, the hardware specific things, right? are on the hardware, and then I can stub them out using techniques that have zero cost abstractions. There's, there's no cost for that abstraction that I'm going through. And I can worry about hardware specific things, bring the board up, write the drivers, the hardware stuff, and make sure that that works while somebody is writing and making sure that the logic is working properly for whatever you're solving, that the algorithms do the right thing, that you know this crazy control loop that we're writing, that the math is proper for that and does what it's supposed to do. Um, the type system helps us enforce correctness. And so we want to use that as much as possible. We want to move as much as we possibly can to compile time errors. We want to error out with the compiler saying, the thing you just tried to do is completely invalid. Don't do that. We're going to see some more of that. All right, take, we're going to look at a couple of abstractions uh, with a little bit of time we got remaining here. So one of the things that the MPU has to talk to is this FPGA. And the way it's going to do that is through something that's called SPY. Um, so SPY is used from everything from like your SD cards. That's how SPY works, or how your SD card works. It's on, on a SPY bus. Um, and it has this idea of uh, one side is considered the master, one side is the slave. We've got a clock. And you have MOSI, which is master out, slave in. On the other side, you have master in, slave out. And it's just this chain that goes around. And the master side is going to do the clocking. And it's just a serial thing that can be fast. And you can start paralyzing the serials in order to do some other neat tricks. But um, there is no way for the FPGA to say, hey, I want to talk to you, MPU, unless there's some other line going back. The MPU is going to make all that decision going forward. It's pretty common. Whether we're talking to the FPGA, or we're talking to the ADCs, or the pressure sensors, there's a lot of different things we have to talk to that are on different spy buses. And they have a protocol, just like anything else would have a protocol, right, that you have to talk to. So how can we implement this? This is not the project that I'm currently describing. This is a project from last year that somebody had some C code that we were just some replacing on. And uh, this is how um, the very exact same problem was solved getting ready to write out to the spy. You get something that's going to describe what you're talking to. And now notice we have this int thing and a value. They've got a callback, and who knows what this context void star thing is. Um, I'm going to set up a length. Data 0 is the, va you know, the command value that's going to go across. I'm going to mem copy um, this value bit in. And I'm going to call request. Uh, and request basically bit bangs this out some port. So who's running the callback down on the OS? What's the system, but who's going to run that callback? It's just a function pointer. Right, but, but, but where does it run? By, by request. A bunch of other things that you don't see. Okay. Eventually, there's going to be an interrupt. of things that come back, something's going to get queued up. There's some main loop, in essence. You can think of it that way, that comes back, pulls things off queues, and processes them for this particular one. Yeah, at some point it'll get, and it won't get called on the interrupt. The interrupt will say, hey, main loop, when you're available, that type of thing. 
Um, so I want you to take a look. What, what stands out, maybe in fact in this one in particular, what's like the, what's an obvious error that's going to be able to be made here? Matt actually talked about this in his lightning talk. The interface just like, what, I'm so, Oh, yeah, 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 mix up thing and mode. And, um, you know, this is a common problem. Uh, it's a really common problem, especially if you have interfaces that look like this. And so how would we naturally fix this? Make them different types. Yeah, make them different types. We just use strong types, right? And then the compiler would tell me right away that I made a mistake, um, which could be a good thing. This is actually, this project was also controlling motors. And getting those two things mixed up would have actually been a very bad idea. So using strong types helps, helps us do the right thing at the time that we're actually um, uh, making our calls. All right, so this is what that looked like. Now, um, I replaced that code set with, um, brought in C++ and there was a bunch of communication problems going on. And the first thing is like, I mean, it looks like we have a protocol. Let's just use types to represent the message type. And then the stuff that's inside of the struct will be the payload that's going to go across. That seems to make sense to me. And then I can just write a serializer for that. And I can talk directly to hardware by somehow sending these things out. So create a protocol. Now I actually, it's not just a thing that I had. I actually, there was a left, a right, or another thing, right? And it would have been nice to call them by that as opposed to some integral value is what was there before. Um, and I set up the structs. Uh, we have this magic that occurs on the other side. If you're familiar with Fusion, the magic that's over here is very similar. It adapts this thing so that I can make a tuple of references to the struct. Then I can play with it in metaprogramming all I want later on. Um, and then I'm going to describe the protocol with this message list. These are the things that can be sent out that port. These are recognizable things. By putting this stuff in, I've, I'm building into the type system that I can use later some, got, some catches if I make mistakes. If I send the wrong type out the wrong port. Like, you know, I'm asking the FPGA to do something that the ADC knows how to do, right? Things like that. So by using the type system to tell what can go in and out of places, uh, then I'm going to find those problems like real early because it won't compile. And somehow I'm going to get one of those then set thing mode types, and I'm just going to call send message, and then the magic will happen. Now, we're not going to talk about what the magic is underneath. Um, I've given plenty of talks talking about serialization using declarative type things, and the, just go look at one of those talks. It's, it's very similar to that. The advantage is, is for all the types that I can possibly think of, I don't have to add new icky code. I don't have to go and write this stuff for the next thing I have to do. All I have to do is add a new struct with the data types I need, adapt it so it knows actually in the metaprogramming drug junk what to do, and I'm done. Junk, junk. yes. So um, the mental burden is gone, and I know about correctness now. I can, I can deal with what am I sending as opposed to all the mechanisms of how to send it. So this ended up taking it from um, 3,292 lines of code down to 1194 lines of code by using this de declarative syntax instead. Now, as Ben said earlier, it's not about reducing lines of code, but like I like to say, every line of code is a liability. So I'm happy to do that, but it also lets me just think at a higher level. How about DOCs, the bytes of code? Bytes of code. So the question is, is um, how many bytes of code did this generate? Um, I don't have that number, but it, it's small. Um, about a third of what you had before? Yeah, it, probably about a third of what I had before. Yeah, it's quite, it, the bytes of code, it's quite a bit smaller than before. Yeah, so how I think about code is if it fits on the 512, I mean, how many of you had a Commodore 64? Right, this is significantly larger. <laughs> if it fits on that, I'm happy. <laughs> so I'm wondering about the actual serialization logic that you're generating there. Are you actually reading each of the struct members you have there individually, or do you apply like the interface class and tricks like No, <laughs> no tricks like that. So the question is like, how does the serialization code work? I will show you afterwards if you'd like. All right, so I want to talk about now another abstraction. Um, and this one, 
this one's dear to my heart because it happens uh, all the time in embedded systems and, um, and, and it should probably happen a whole lot in non-embedded systems, which are state machines. Uh, we kind of live and breathe on state machines. We don't sometimes identify them as state machines, but we have state machines everywhere. And state machines are really wonderful things. We should just like use them. We don't use them, I think, as often as we should is because they're a pain to implement. So here is a state machine. This is um, using UML syntax. We've got when a connect message occurs or event, um, call the establish function, or it's going to perform the establish function as it moves into connecting. Uh, this one right here, ping, it's a self-transition. Ping is the event, is valid is the guard condition, and then reset uh, timeout is then going to be the function that's performed. Um, so, you know, most of us have seen code that use switch statements and if blocks to implement things like that. And they become completely unmaintainable at some point. It's like the person who wrote it knows how it works. No one else knows how it works. But if you could somehow lift yourself out of that abstraction and just believe that state machine generators can do what they're supposed to do, then you could think at a higher level. So Ben was talking about like operator overloads and people frowning on them, I think one great reason for an oper operator overload is for a domain-specific embedded language, like this one. So this is Chris Jusiak's um, Boost SML. And notice that the, the, the syntax looks a lot like the UML syntax. It's not like having to learn something completely foreign, but these this transition table represents the state machine. I can easily go back and forth between the two of them. I can look at a table and realize that, oh, I'm going to move from the connected state if there's a ping, is valid as the guard, it's going to do this reset timeout. Oh, it has no destination, which means that it's itself. The one below it is when there's a timeout event, it's going to actually uh, run established and it's going to move to the connecting state. This is a really nice way to write a state machine, right? I've lifted myself out of the drudgery of switch statements and if and the how to do it. And now I'm worried about like, what are we trying to accomplish? I can look at this and verify that the table does what I expect it to do. This is like the business logic I'm trying to solve. The motor is going to do what I want it to do, that type of thing, right? And this is where I want to live. Uh, so what does this look like? Um, we saw the state machine part. Uh, what is this established? Well, established is it's a callable thing, a nullary callable thing. And what is, is valid? Well, it's, um, it's just something that will be called with the event and it will return a Boolean. So um, this is a really nice abstraction, allows me to think higher. It's declarative in nature right? Declaring. When I go to actually now use the state machine, have a state machine object, and I call process event and I pass in a type, right? All of our events were types. Well, how convenient is that? Because I just got done writing the serialization thing that deals with types. I'm starting to lift myself into this position where all the tools that I'm using now are are going to check themselves at compile time to make sure that I'm forming and constructing something that's valid. Um, this is out of uh, Chris's, by the way, all of those items were out of Chris's slides. And you can look up Chris and see, um, here's the GitHub for it. Look him up online and see different talks that he has as he goes through this and gives the, the details. Um, you know, one of the things that comes up quite a bit is, well, yeah, how big is the state machine though? What does it require for state? Well, if you were to write this with an enum or a switch, you would take up a byte to represent that machine. Well, SML also takes up one byte to represent the machine. If you're naively to write this with a, you know, a series of classes, you're going to end up with three bytes. So it ends up that it's just as efficient. Um, and watch his presentations. 
uh, it, is, it is very, very impressive. All right, so let's see if we can lift ourselves even higher up out of this. I personally think the downside of state machines, hierarchical state machines, is that they can become very complex very quickly. I only like to think about one thing at a time when I'm dealing with embedded systems. And I want to deal with that one thing in the state machine for that and verify it. And I would really like to have distributed state machines. State machines that communicate to each other and pass events. That's what I would like. Well, ends up back in the 90s, there was this thing called real-time object-oriented modeling. Um, it was the predecessor to UML's um, um, real-time extensions. And real-time object-oriented modeling had this concept of distributed state machines in which you would describe not just the behavior as a state machine, um, but you would describe then what they called structure included ports. And ports are how state machines sent information back and forth to one another. And it allowed you then to bind machines together. You could either do this binding at runtime, or you could do it at, for our sake, we can do it at compile time. So if we can do compile time binding, as you could imagine from Vittorio's talk yesterday, that gets rid of all of the overhead. I already know what I need to call into. So we have a, um, a library called Lawden that does this. It allows us to take one more step back. Uh, looking at this, this bit right here, like what are these communications? Well, what they are is um, this abstraction, we're going to set up a protocol. That port represents a protocol. So I'm going to have, again, some types that represent the messages I can send. The type is the message type. The data inside of the type is the payload that can be sent. Um, and then I'm going to actually describe a protocol. Protocols have valid input messages and valid output messages, things that they can send in and out of a port. And then once I describe that in Lauden, we use SML to describe the state machine. It used to be MSM, but SML compiles smaller and it's faster. Um, so we use that to describe our state machines. And then we use a, um, a syntax that looks like this, create some ports of what the tags are going to be called. I have an app port, a stepper port, a timer port. And then I just I create a type list. These are the ports. These are the ports, and these are the protocols that they're representing. Now, when I go to bind these together, these distributed state machines, it can check at compile time that I'm connecting two things that are actually allowed to act send messages back and forth. That's nice. And it gets rid of the overhead that's associated with it. It allows me to think at a higher level again. The one other thing, and Bryce kind of actually mentioned this, um, he was like, well, where's that callback going to run? By doing this, we have what we call the controller. It's handling all of the messaging that's going back and forth between these state machines. And in our distributed model, it's also our multitasking model, so to speak. The controller can actually implement and impose policies of any sort that we would like. It can take care of the fact that there are interrupts occurring in the system that it should not cause trouble with, um, and what to do with those, and how to get them back into the system, and where to, where to move things. Um, so it gives us, again, a nice abstraction for that. The other thing is, if you notice, we were simply binding protocols, which are types. And now I can bind a protocol that represents that SPI bus I want to talk to, or the FPGA, or the whatever I want. I just say, bind to that hardware device, because I'm already sending types all over the place. They're already serialized when they get there and, and communicate properly. So, um, this is an, another way of just thinking at a higher level. A couple more things to think about or to look at. Um, th th this conference, Odin gave a talk on mix-ins. Um, it's, a, it's a great talk talking about, um, he has this agent thing that he's been working on for a while and a series of libraries. The concepts in it are really great for the embedded type work where you're trying to take a lot of different information and figure out how to um, assemble something that makes sense for the different, the different platforms. Watch those. He also has something about these um, special registers that chips have. So every device, when you, when you look at a device, it's just memory. You're accessing what appears to be memory. Memory is hooked up to some bits that do something or another. This particular one is this module stop control register. 
And you'll see when you look, every single bit in here controls stop controls of something different, some other module. It's not like, you know, this memory address controls this one thing. It, like, it controls a whole bunch of different things. And he has a technique of dealing with that also, which is actually very clever. Um, all right, some final thoughts. We'll be using C++ on the project. <laughs> it was hard to tell. <laughs> um, I can see Tal's back there typing to Sharon right now. We are using C++, continue. Um, so these things aren't, no, aren't news. Tool vendors aren't super friendly to C++. But uh, my experience has been it's worth the effort to figure out how to make it, make it go. And unlike most of the Stack Overflow community for other questions you might have, the community is very small that's trying to do this. And so it, it, it takes work to try to understand what you need to do and, and how to get there. Starting off with vendor tools and kind of understanding what it is that they're doing gets you a long way. I'll tell you right now, probably their linker, their linker map is wrong. I, I've not seen one that supports C++ correctly yet. It always needs some modification, as well as the startup code for initialization of, of bits and pieces. Um, create create a, uh, a test bed that you can run on the target that really tests out the features of C++ that you expect to use. Um, abstractions are wonderful. Use good tools, including Compiler Explorer. If you are really that concerned about it, just use Compiler Explorer. See what it is that you just did. Measure, 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 measure. Don't make decisions based upon what you think is happening. Actually measure it. And then tests. And, and the way you get to write tests is because you make abstractions, these abstraction levels, so that you can actually test in a, in a way that you, you're not refined only by the um, the target hardware. Any questions? Um, when you're going through the process of setting up a new C++ tool chain for some, you know, whatever the, the particular uh, embedded platform is that's going to be for, used for your next project, are you able to reuse a lot of the work that you um, have done to get uh, C++ tool chains up and running on previous projects? Um, or is it like you sort of like you're using the same techniques, you sort of have some expertise doing it, but everything's completely different? Yeah, so Bryce, Bryce's question is, is uh, how much reuse between projects um, do you end up having? And it depends upon a variety of different things, but how it kind of boils down to is, are you in the same CPU family that you were in before? Or the MPU family, MCU family? And um, so that's going to cause potentially great variations along the way. Um, and the other is, what kind of peripherals are you using for this project that you weren't using previously? Those are going to cause potential pain. Um, but there's kind of a recipe once you get started. And, and you know, if, if you don't have a clue where to start, the best place to start is like, go grab the linker script out of your, the compiler right now, right? And just take a look at that. That gives you an idea of what you need to worry about at least. Yeah. Tony? Uh, do you use variant for polymorphism? The question is, do I use variant for polymorphism? Or any other reason. Yeah. So uh, I actually do. Um, I do use variant for polymorphism quite a bit, in fact. It, does, it compiles down well enough. So I have, I have a different measure than, than some people. My, my measure literally is, does it fit on the device and does it run fast enough? And beyond that, I don't care, right? It's just not worth my effort to put more into it. Yeah, so I do actually use variant quite a bit. Michael, nope, not Michael, John, sorry. Uh, do you know if there's a push to put the linker scripts and stuff like that for C++ and GitHub, or are there people doing it open source, or are there just getting shipped out yesterday? Um, so the question is, is there an effort to put linker scripts into GitHub? You, so when you get a compiler, even this bare bones compiler, uh, it has linker scripts already. The problem is that the linker script will probably not, may not fit your MCU memory map. You need to muck around with it. Just a comment. What, what, I think you have a comment there? Oh, do I compile with exceptions? Sorry, let me get this comment first. Yes, Tom? just a comment to this. Um, so 
I guess the Linker script, this is just a basic Linker script. Now, of course, uh, you might want to change this uh, as much as you like, but it's a good starting point, but yeah. I guess it's too diverse. Yeah, yeah, so that Tom's comment is that it's kind of, you're starting off with a basic Linker script, and then there's stuff you're going to do. Absolutely. Um, you're going to you're gonna start putting things in to the linker script that you didn't know that you were going to put in the linker script. The linker script's a way to give symbols associated with memory, for example. Because uh, you're going to be writing volatile a lot and wondering whether or not the compiler is going to get rid of that register that it thinks doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, at some point, there are other tricks to get around that. And just creating it in the linker script is one way. It's a symbol now that's not going away. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yes. Oh, exceptions, thank you. Exceptions, John, right? Um, no, we don't use exceptions. And we don't use exceptions for a variety of reasons, but, but usually the largest reason is the amount of bloat that comes in with the exceptions when we just turn them on. So when you compile the flags, I didn't see F, no RTDI, and F function sections? Yep. Why? Because that was actually slideware. <laughs> so the question was, or the comment was, is that there was no RTTTI, and which one was the other one that you were using? Yeah, function sections. So there are a variety of other flags that you may want to turn on. That is one of them. Stack Unwind is the other one that you may want to look at. Yeah. Jens? So the overhead you have to do to achieve this, is it worth it? Oh, okay. So yeah, the question is, is the overhead to achieve this worth it? Um, I strongly believe the overhead to achieve it is well, well worth it. Um, and the reason, the reason is because I get to actually use the language to help find errors that I know are going to exist later on. By having the type system available to me, it is going to find all kinds of things that are very horrible that may not be found otherwise. Like, like switching those two ints as a perfect example, right? That, that could have really bad consequences that you may not find until it gets to the field because your testing's weak or, or whatever, right? But if I, can, if I can reduce the number of bad things that might occur um, in an embedded system, it, I, I, you, you can imagine that you know, Farmer Joe with this thing that's shaking trees doesn't want an internet connection so I can update his firmware when it doesn't work. It kind of has to just work when it goes out. And so anything I do to help prove to myself that it does what it's supposed to do, um, I'll, you know, I'll pay a lot of time up front to make sure that that's right. What do you do about the customers who are upset that they resolve to have all this? Uh, well, so my customers are never upset. It's the people in my training that are upset. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the compiling stuff out, I think, is just, it's going to take time to help convince people that they want to think at a different level. They don't want to use their debugger to figure out what code does. They want to reason and understand. Uh, they want to like, separate business logic from the how things are going to get done. The how things are going to get done, and I really want to know the details of that and how it's going to work. That, that's going to be super important. Just a couple more. Um, the scale of the project, like how long? Yeah, how long? It, it depends upon the. Monthly. Yeah, no, it depends upon the project. Um, this project is probably nine months of effort or so, I think is what it will be. And uh, the tools, fighting with the tools probably was about two weeks of effort uh, of the C side. Sharon's been fighting with the C tools a lot, but. <laughs> That's like the normal what you expect to be fighting. You're going to do that with any embedded project. Chandler? I just want to point out, like, there's an alternative, which is that you support optimized debugging. And then you change debugger, and it's okay, and you don't see, like, tons of stuff, and you still have a reasonable chance to match your code. Um, I think that, that relying on O0 to debug your code is the real problem here. We should be able to debug code with some amount of optimization turned on. Uh, GCC is actually uh, way out in front in this uh, department. GCC has dash O Z, which optimizes, but specifically tries to preserve the debuggability of your source code, uh, which I think is really fantastic, and, and we should be doing more of that. Uh, Microsoft Compiler also, uh, their default mode, 
doesn't turn the optimizer completely off, but it remains very debuggable. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that like Clang actually is, is kind of uh, uh, at the back here. It's not doing a very good job, and we should be demanding our compilers actually support this mm. as, as a first class workflow. So Chandler's uh, making the comment that that our tools should actually be better at helping us with debug mode. That GCC is good with the dash OG and produces pretty optimized code that's still debuggable. Microsoft's doing, uh, sounds like fairly well with that too. And, um, and Clang has some catch up that they're working on. Um, so that would, that would also be helpful. All right, I think we are well past time now. All right, yeah, I'm getting the Tony, you're well past time. <laughs> Thank you for coming.